week's theme is industry research. We're going to be talking about industry research careers for PhDs and postdocs. We want you to be uh, smart in um, thinking about your career goals. And in post-pandemic world, the things are going to be very different. So therefore, uh, you should be planning it right now. I'm going to start, first of all, by asking all of you to introduce yourself briefly and talk about your career journey. So I'm gonna say the name so that it's easier for us to follow. How about we start with Megan first? Okay, hello. Thank you, Harinder, so much for hosting this. My name is Megan Newcomb and I was very recently in grad school. I actually defended in December and started my new industry position in January. So my PhD is in chemistry. I worked for the Ribby lab uh, and most of the work that I did was more molecular biology. And as part of my PhD research, I grew a lot of bacteria. I, did a lot of fermentations and so I applied for fermentation scientist positions primarily in the Bay Area and in Southern California and now I work for a startup company a biotech company in San Leandro which is in the Bay Area and my position is fermentation scientist so it's a scientist one uh, position so it's only been seven months so there hasn't been much career movement so far <laughs> Well, thank you, Megan, for coming back. In spite of the fact that you just started, you still um, were able to find time to come and see us. I know things might be super difficult depending on how things are going. And also, I want to tell people that Megan is um, al our alumni of our GPS 10 program at UC Irvine, and so is Brandon. So why don't we move over to Brandon now? Hello, Brandon. Hi, Harinder. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Brandon Matthews. Um, I also uh, received my PhD in chemistry, I think we're the same year, right, Megan? Um, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so my PhD, I mainly focus on analytical chemistry, analytical science, um, a lot of surface modification, sur surface detection, uh, nanoparticle ensemble measurements, that sort of thing. And so when I wanted to make the transition out to industry, most of the jobs that I applied for were more for a uh, research development tool chemist and an analytical position. And so I've been at my current job for uh, about eight, nine months, I think. Um, and so I um, don't do the exact same thing I, I did in, uh, in undergrad, or excuse me, grad school, whereas uh, now I still develop um, sensors, but now it's gas, um, gas and liquid-based sensors. And um, we can talk more about that, but uh, in, in essence, I kind of parlayed what I did in grad school to get my current position. And uh, while it's not a one-to-one -one, um, transition, it, it, it covered enough where I got the job. And so I'm pretty happy there, all things considered, so. Perfect. Um, so I'm a senior scientist um, about 20 minutes south of UC Irvine. Um, in a city called Elisa Viejo. So I work at Neogenomic Laboratories, um, which is a, a cancer diagnostic company. So um, when I got, I got my PhD from UC Irvine um, a while back in 2014. Um, and so I was mostly, um, my PhD is technically in biological sciences, but I did mostly molecular work. I was working with cancer and immunology, virology, um, in the different labs that I worked in, um, but mostly, mostly molecular biology kinds of things, um, tissue culture, Western blots, all that kind of jazz, PCR. And so after I got my PhD, at that point, I pretty much knew that I wasn't really going to stay in academia, but I went and did an academic postdoc anyway. Um, and the, the person that I did my postdoc with, two-body problem, so I, I ended up going to UC Riverside, so I stayed stayed nearby for my postdoc. Um, the, the lab that I went into, he graduated a lot of postdocs going into industry, right? He wasn't trying to filter people into going to academia per se. And so um, we sort of agreed at the beginning that it would be sort of a shortish postdoc. So I was there for a little under two and a half years. So it was just rather, you know, get some projects, get some publications, get, get the knowledge under your belt, and then leave and go to industry. You know, he didn't see the need to waste any time, you know, staying in academia if you knew you weren't actually going to stay there permanently. So, um, so after the postdoc, then I um, took a, a short break before um, looking for positions um, in industry. And so most of my postdoc was um, 
still molecular based, but I had branched into like immunohistochemistry kinds of techniques, specifically fluorescent base. And so that's um, the position that I sort of have now, um, the research um, and development position that is in my sort of corner of the company supporting pharma services, um, pharmaceutical drug trials and things like that um, is mostly IHC based and fluorescence based. Um, so I've been here for a little under two and a half years now. Um, and my role has sort of continued to develop. I came in as a scientist one, um, and now I'm a senior scientist. Um, and so now I actually also manage the lab that we, that we run that I came into to be an R&D scientist. Um, and so I now I help manage the wet lab operations as well as, as being um, involved with client interactions. Thank you, Erin. We can go to Gilbert now. Hello, my name's Gilbert Martinez, and I got my PhD even longer ago than Aaron. Uh, and it was, you know, during the midst of the recession, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I did a postdoc because uh, they're not really that hard to get because uh, you don't get paid much money. Uh, so I had, I was very productive in that first postdoc experience, but it went terribly because, you know, there's some advisors who are, are not the best. Uh, but at that point, I thought I really wanted to be in academia because I, you know, helped get several R01 grants. Uh, so I joined another lab for a second postdoc and started to build uh, a research program for my eventual lab. But then uh, I ended up in a relationship and the two body problem came in and our deal was uh, whoever gets the best academic job first determines where we, went, we end up. And uh, my partner got a job at uh, Chapman University. And uh, so I was looking both academic and industry positions uh, in Southern California, and something came up at, at the time was Allergan, the Botox company, uh, doing biophysical characterization. Uh, so I took a senior scientist position uh, doing biophysical characterization, and really they kind of wanted me to just provide routine testing support uh, initially, but that soon morphed into <laughs> more and more responsibility, including leading the 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 whole biophysical characterization uh, for Allergan. And uh, this was last year, so it like all happened so quickly. Uh, and in May, we just got acquired by uh, AbbVie, which is a larger company. And so now we are combined uh, like the third or fourth largest pharmaceutical company in the world, which is a little crazy and not at all what I imagined I, I would be doing, uh, but it's been a pretty great experience so far. Awesome. Thank you. So that was really nice introduction. Let's, you know, we had a good start, but it's interesting to see that we have really like half and half. Um, two of you actually only did PhD and then got into industry and Aaron and Gilbert did brief postdocs or long postdocs and then got into industry. So. I'll get to that point very soon, but if I can ask like next natural question about more about your company, what you exactly do, <clears throat> and then I think that'll connect it to how is that different from academic research lab? So we can go in the same sequence, Megan. Okay, so I work for a startup company called Geltor Inc. So Geltor is about five years old. We just hit 50 employees and half of those are operations business side. So there's not, there aren't that many scientists. And Geltor is a very cool platform. It's a bacterial expression platform that we use to produce proteins that are typically derived from animals. And so our goal is to make sustainable vegan alternatives to um, collagens. Right now it's our big protein, but we have other proteins in our arsenal. And so uh, by producing vegan sustainable alternatives to collagens, we can provide those to beauty products as well as food products, which is what I'm most interested in. And day to day, my job is to run bacterial fermentations to produce those proteins. So each week I'm either screening new bacterial strains to produce new proteins, 
or try to make more of those proteins, or I am optimizing fermentation conditions to maximize the yield of our target protein. So that means I'm literally running the bioreactors. I'm probably designing the experiments to, to decide what we're running each week, and then monitoring, collecting data, and then quantifying our yields of different proteins each week. And then on top of that, there's some other work to be done to kind of help with other portions of the company, which is one benefit of a startup is that my work is not just fermentation. I'm able to help with other stuff. I think one of the best things about it is that if something fails, you move on. You don't have to keep working to make something work if it's not going to work because it's a waste of time and it's a waste of money and resources. So it's really nice to not have to um, repeatedly fail at something aiming to get it to work. Um, the pace is very fast in general. For a startup, things change constantly, which I find very exciting, but I think some people could find that a little disconcerting. My boss is but there's a lot more like business-wide goals. I would say my boss is more interested not only in my personal well-being and my growth in the company, but the overall business. Whereas, um, depending on your PI, of course, their perspective might be a little bit more narrow. Their their goal is a little bit more narrow. Um, and yeah, that's all I'll say. My my boss has a more broad appreciation for all of the things that need to happen well and and such to support the overall company versus his own goals. That's, that almost sounds like a very different business model. Here in academic business model, you're looking, you're doing all the research and rating data, publishing papers to get the grants. However, on the industry side, it seems like, um, of course, revenue is important, at least getting the product out in the market is important and it's more translatable. And I believe there are more rewards compared to doing basic research in academia here. How about we move over to Brandon now? Sure. So. Uh, much like Megan, uh, my company is on the smaller side. It is uh, intentionally kept like that, where I think we just passed like maybe 35 um, employees, uh, but the company has been around for about 20-ish years or so. Um, and so um, I guess just doing the direct comparison to grad school to now, um, my day-to-day -day tasks kind of vary as the company itself um, his name is, uh, I work at a place called Intelligent Optical Systems, but that is kind of a misnomer now as it's gone through a lot of changes over the years. And so the only thing that kind of links all the various projects and employees together is that we use uh, the same device that measures uh, phase shifts uh, when there's surface binding or um, sur surface absorption, uh, excuse me, events occurring or some sort of pH change and whatnot. Um, but beyond that, uh, we're kind of, it's interesting because I didn't realize this when I uh, first applied is that uh, a majority of the funding that we get at the company is actually uh, government based grants. And so whereas we're not necessarily concerned in the traditional sense of industry uh, for our customer base, uh, we go in knowing uh, what we have to accomplish. These are the tasks and the goals and milestones that we have to hit in order to get um, paid um, at a um, predetermined um, set of, uh, of time. With that, however, is um, you, a lot of people are kind of incrementally placed, meaning that uh, I myself, when I first started, I was on one project. Um, then for a short period, I was on five, and now I'm down to three. And so the company is kind of like, be aware of all the projects that you're um, that you're that you fall under for your particular umbrella. So either uh, sensor projects or more um, biological based projects. But with that, you're not expected to work on all of them at all times. Uh, you're expected to work very hard. And uh, it's why I was late today, because I had to do some last minute things for a coworker. It happens, um, which is probably the biggest change um, actually from industry to um, from academia, where um, your coworkers sometimes don't actually know all the things that you do for them. And that's intentional and in that um, they don't need to know because it's not relevant and they can move on. And this is one piece that you will apply. They know what to do with it. They don't need to know all the ins and outs. And then they can move on with their side of the, uh, their side of the project. Um, relating back to my day-to-day -day stuff. So because of the pandemic and everything going on, there's been a, a fair amount of like change up and shifts um, in the company. And so whereas before I was strictly um, an R&D chemist, I did data collection, I worked it up. Um, I reported to my manager at the time 
um, he has decided to step down for personal reasons. So, so now I do all that work, but I'm also taking on more of a project manager sort of role as well, where I communicate more so with the customers. Um, I help with the monthly reports and whatnot. And so um, I guess it's almost like my current stage, like grad school on steroids. It's kind of interesting. I've learned a lot because it is smaller and because um, you kind of shift around to so many different projects um, that you're, you're, you're in being there just for the eight months, I actually realized I know a lot more and I've become a lot more comfortable in the company, even though I didn't go for a postdoc like a number of other of my uh, coworkers did. Um, but that didn't leave me as a detriment in my day-to-day -day work. And um, my supervisor is very, um, so much, so, so much uh, more beneficial to my improvement and, and growing um, versus grad school where he's concerned where it's like, can you handle this work? This is a lot of things that you have to suddenly do. Um, let's be as a comedy as we can for the pandemic, but we also have to make sure our customers are satisfied because this is a lot of money that they're giving us. Um, and so it's just kind of a balancing act between it all. Um, not un unlike grad school uh, to an extent, but um, basically the more you get into it, it it gets easier over time. It's just kind of jarring at first where, where it's like, oh, I can clock out and I don't have to worry about work until tomorrow morning. This is fantastic. And I get paid so much more. So um, yeah, that's pretty great for industry. So. That's, so now we'll move over to uh, Gilbert and Erin because both of you are working in, if I can say, large, mid to large size companies and both of you have done postdocs. So it's really, uh, I'm curious to hear what your experience has been since you did postdoc, maybe had a better uh, sort of an understanding of academic landscape and then transition into an industry, mid to large size industry. How's that role different from your postdoc um, research? And, and sort of like what, what main differences you see between academia, maybe startup if you were in or in the large company? Yeah, so, so I did uh, two postdocs. Uh, and uh, from, from graduate school, I, I, I had undergrads that I mentored. So I always had that mentoring uh, experience uh, and, and that you know, certainly paid off as a postdoc. Uh, if you want to be successful, you, you, you know, or as a PI, you're going to have to manage people. So uh, I learned that as a, as a grad student, and that was something that uh, was just important to me in general, regardless of what my trajectory was going to be. So I kept that as a postdoc and, you know, was able to you know, do more experiments because I had several undergrads working with me. Uh, and that was very helpful because it you know you in industry at least my position in industry it's you know you have one meeting in the morning and you're doing x and then you know you go grab a, a coffee go to the restroom and then you have another meeting about why and then you know after lunch you have two more meetings about two completely different things uh so uh, uh it, it, it was like my postdoc on steroids to, to use the other metaphor. Like it, it, it's just so much more complex. There's so many things going on, uh, so many project teams. And uh, since we've been acquired, we're trying to, to communicate better than we had before. And you find out that, you know, they, other departments really could use your expertise and they hadn't been. So we're trying to integrate that. So it's, you know, one meeting at troubleshooting and uh, we want to do some basic research too uh, now that we have a little bit more money with the acquisition so you know starting to do that and like having to go back and uh, go to PubMed and, and do some of that research has been uh, uh, fun uh, but it wasn't something that I had, had to have much I didn't spend much time doing until the last uh, three months or so, but the first six months of my position was just kind of learning what to do uh, and the regulatory requirements and, you know, getting clearance to actually work with some of the molecules and uh, yeah, it just kind of skyrocketed and spiraled out of control as far as the number of things to go and and like the different groups you have to communicate with. Like we have a, 
a fermentation group. I, you know, I don't have to grow any of my protein anymore, or I don't have to purify any of my protein anymore. But we talk to the fermentation scientists because, you know, we need more samples. So like, okay, how can we try to make it better? What are the critical quality attributes that you should be looking for that lead to fat stability? So there's just a lot of crosstalk between the, the different groups. And the biggest difference for me is that you need the success of everybody on your team because uh, if you want a good product, it needs from the first step to the last step, it needs to be done right. And in academia, a lot of times it's, oh, I'm doing this all myself. I'm not gonna share any of my information. Uh, but no, you can't do that. And it, it's such a liberating experience to be in an environment that, uh, you know, reliance on your colleagues is success is, is very important. It's not just you, it's the team. And I really uh, like that uh, change. So Erin, what do you think about, um, you know, your experience with um and working in a large size company. Um, it, it, would, would you consider New Genomics as a large size company? Or yeah, yes. O overall, New Genomics is quite large. Um, the portion of which I work in is sort of smaller. So we have, since, since Neo is um, primarily a, a cancer diagnostic testing company, then we have a huge clinical side of things. Um, and then the smaller portion of the company I think we're like over a hundred people at this point over in the pharma services, then we have sort of completely separate projects. You know, sometimes projects will bridge, but most of the time our projects are separate. And then within pharma services, the multiomics group that I work in, we have about 20 people. So it's, so it's, it's sort of like being in a university where there's, there's lots of people, but then your lab is much smaller. Um, the number of people who are in multi-mix are larger than the labs that I worked in as both um, under, um, well, yeah, undergrad, um, grad school, postdoc. So there's more people. So I absolutely agree with Gilbert. Communication is top notch. Like you have, you're communicating all throughout the day. Um, and I would also echo as well that the number of things that you end up working on, right? Since we're a, a client driven company, then the different services that we're providing, instead of going to go get grants, you know, you're trying to get paid by your customers. So you're meeting specific turnaround times. So some of the things that are, are different from being either a grad student or a postdoc is you have very defined goals. And even though theoretically you're supposed to have defined goals as a grad student or postdoc, you know, the time frame can vary and you know, you have to hit your head against the wall and you try the same thing over and over again, trying to get it to work, as Megan said. Um, here, it's a lot more structured. And so we have certain deadlines that we have to hit so that you can get certain, you know, revenue um, generated. Um, and since there's different parts of the company, so there's a different part of the company that actually handles like the samples coming into the company putting them into our laboratory management system. And then they go to a different portion of the company in order to actually get one kind of testing before the samples are actually routed to our lab. So it's like one giant collaboration. Like we're all on the same team. We all have to do our own part in order to make it happen, to make the study successful. But like nobody's an island. You have to rely on everyone within, you know, for in my case, like smaller multiomics, but I'm constantly working with the project managers, with the accessioning team, everybody, right? So, so that's something that I appreciate. I like being part of the team and collaborating and, and not having to be like the one person who has to know and do everything, right? You know, like it's, a, it's a team effort. Um, in terms of the fact that now, you know, I run the lab, um, I don't do as much wet, like personal wet lab work as I had originally thought that I would do when I joined the company. Um, somebody stepped down as the lab manager. And so I stepped into that supervisory position and that was a learning curve in of itself. Um, and so now I, I manage the day-to-day -day operations of the lab. So I need to have a certain level of understanding all the projects that are going on, even though I'm not personally responsible as like the scientific lead, I need to know 
enough of what's happening, the status of the project. And so I end up joining pretty much all of the, um, like the client interaction, like interfacing calls that we have. Most of the time it's biweekly, but when you have 20 or 30 projects ongoing, then it, it adds up. Thankfully they're biweekly. Um, some are monthly, those are nice, but um, we all end up having a lot of, a lot of WebExes, a lot of this, except without video, because most of the time we don't do video. Um, and so even though I'm not like the, the main driver of a bunch of those projects, I still have to be in communication enough and know enough of what everybody else needs to do to sort of track it down. You know, I'm sort of the grease between the different cogs um, is sort of how I think of myself um, for a bunch of different projects. And then I actually lead projects myself, like I'm the study lead. So then I am the person on the WebEx call giving updates, how, how are things going, having the scientific discussions, having the report out of their data um, and things like that. Um, I would say that, um, you know, in terms of, at least at, at, least at NEO, You'll, you guys can't read it because it's very small, but this happened behind me. This happened to me. <laughs> I just happened to be sitting in a conference room where it's displayed. But we have a focus chart for 2020. Every year we have a focus chart of like, what are our goals? What are the quality goals? What are the attributes of the company that they want to inspire in the people who are working here? And where are we going to go from here? And so back in grad student postdoc land, I didn't really feel a whole lot of care and support from the PIs that I, I worked with, right? It's like, here's your project, don't screw up. And then every time you'd have your meeting with them, they're like, you're, you're screwing up again, right? So that's mostly how I felt a lot <laughs> during my, my PhD and, and postdoc years. Um, but here, yes, revenue is important, but if somebody leaves, that's really detrimental. And so you know, they want to make sure that we have a career development path and we're happy. Um, because of COVID-19 schedules, the lab now runs on certain days. It runs seven days a week um, to try to do socially distancing for certain of the lab members who are higher risk. So we start at two in the morning and on certain days we don't end until like 11 or 12 at night. And since I'm the supervisor, then I'm technically sort of on call, not that I'm necessarily like nobody, they're not really reaching out to me at that time, but you know, it's a different kind of, you know, I, I don't clock out as much as I guess I thought I would in industry where it's like, Oh, it's fine. Bye guys. Um, and that may just be, that may just be me. I don't want to leave my team hanging um, when they're working on something. And when it's patient samples, there's a lot more regulation. Um, there's a lot more, um, different systems, different computer systems that have to be up to certain levels of certifications, different kinds of documentations that have to be controlled documents, um, all of these sorts of things that are very different from academic um, life. You know, academia is just like, oh, here's an experiment, I run it, bam, done. Here it's like, well, to start up the study, we need four to six weeks to go over all the paperwork and have all of the statements of work signed and the contracts and get it into our document controlled system and all this kind of stuff. So, so that's very different, um, you know, the level of, of documentation that you need and control, but it's for patient care. So I understand that that level of, of tracking is necessary. Um, and so I actually work pretty heavily with our LIMS um, team um, for developing the module that we use in multi-omics. Um, so that's, you know, sort of a different random hat that I ended up wearing. I'm not sure how I got volunteered into that position. <laughs> Started answering some questions and then suddenly I became the person. So, you know, you kind of find the different things that are interesting to do. Um, but that's been a very good learning experience in terms of the level of tracking that needs to be um, taken because when you're dealing with patient samples, you know, the, the clinical side requires a lot more stringent regulations than, than in academia. And we've also heard something that, you know, once you get in, start, you know, companies start working on a project and if it doesn't lead to the results you were expecting, um, they just throw that idea out 
they just remove that, you know, basically defund the project and move on and start something new. Is that really true in industry? Please go ahead. Anyone can answer based on your experience now. I would say yes and no. Uh, it depends on what part of the, uh, the where in the Gantt chart you are. Gantt chart is something that uh, you, you hear a lot about in industry, but uh, depends where you are in the, the process, you know. So we, uh, you know, our previous uh, management acquired some molecules that were like, oh, well, you know, we probably shouldn't be doing these but we purchased them at a pretty far stage and like, okay, we have to make this work and it's, you're making it work and we're, we're making it work. But, you know, on hindsight, you know, I'd be like, well, is the benefit really, are we really going to make enough money from this to justify it? Uh, but when you cross a certain threshold when it's like, you have to make it work and you make, you, you just make it work. But, you know, the discovery phase, yeah, you can throw things away that aren't, aren't working, but if you've already invested a lot, uh, if you're in phase two clinical trial, you need to, you know, really, really, really try to make it work because that's a lot of uh, investment that went into that. Mm -hmm. Erin? Yeah, I would absolutely, yeah, I would absolutely agree. Um, we have the vast majority of our projects are external with clients, but we also do our own R and D for internal um, panels that we put together. And essentially we're developing things that we would then potentially sell externally. Right. So the goal is always out there to, to make money, to provide services. Um, so internally, if something's not working, Hey, we can easily just drop it super easily. Um, if a client is involved and it's in a contract, it depends on the client. Um, you know, if the client, if we, it, it's a lot about managing client's expectations um, and managing the types of risks, like how early do you flag risks, how are things going? Um, and so some clients are very willing to say, oh, hey, you know, since, since we do, um, the primarily we're doing immuno-oncology. So we're testing the tumor microenvironment um, Name, name a type of immune cell that somebody's interested in, and we're probably looking at something. Um, and so we customize our panels for our clients. And so um, we have, you know, over 150 antibodies for different markers that, that we've already characterized for ourselves and that we're actually using for, for our clients. But then a lot of people will want to come with their favorite marker or in the clinical trial, their particular like clone of antibody that they're using as a therapeutic um, target. And so, you know, sometimes the, the clients will just, you know, like, oh, well, that's not important. Or if we have sort of an alternative, you know, this is where being the subject matter expert on our end, you know, part of our, part of, part of what we sell is that the vast majority, I think half of multiomics are PhDs. So we have a lot of, you know, knowledge, expertise, and so we can sort of recommend and sort of shift, you know, like, well, if this one doesn't work, how about this? This is an alternative, you know, if we do this combination. And so sometimes we can help guide the project. And so some of the clients, you know, it's just not going to work. And then they have to make the decision between, you know, if we keep banging our head against the wall and trying for something more to like make it work, then it's going to impact turnaround time. It's going to impact when, they're, when we can actually give them their data. Um, and so the ones that are like, nah, cut your losses, proceed, then they're pretty easy. Um, other clients are very frugal, you know, stingy mm. frugal, you know, they just may not have enough in their budget to keep banging your head against the wall and keep trying all the things. And so, um, then you, you have to really figure out how angry they are and how much are their potential contracts. Mm -hmm. And so we may have to do some work for free in order to secure the, you know, $1.3 million contract that's down the pipeline, you know, okay, give them 15 grand now because the hopes is that they'll sign that other contract that's worth a lot more money. Um, so those kinds of, those kinds of like business side and revenue generating um, decision, mm -hmm. you know, that's sort of interesting as I've, as I've grown in the company, 
um, I'm included in more and more of the sort of like business side of things. So then mm -hmm. understanding, you know, what are the line items, you know, how are the contracts put together? Um, but yeah, sometimes clients are really difficult and being in a, you know, customer service, like the client is always right. They're not right. Mm -hmm. And yet you can't just like tell them off and say, no, uh, you have to come up with additional solutions. Um, and try to manage that. And some clients are very difficult and you will spend, you know, 90% of your time placating one client because they're super, super difficult. Um, so it, it can be very difficult. You know, you have, you have both sides of the coin. You're very sort of like easygoing clients and then you have thankfully a smaller proportion of clients that can be very challenging. That's, that's great to hear. I have, uh, I'm actually, there are two questions from the audience and I'm going to combine those two questions. And this is questions, these two questions are, well, one question is going to be Megan and Brandon both. So this is an interesting one. What are some of the things you used to believe about industry research that you don't anymore? So since both of you transitioned very recently, how has your um, sort of perception or understanding or myth has um, changed before getting into industry and now after being in industry? And second thing, do you think um, you should have done a postdoc before getting into this industry position? There aren't any myths that come to mind. All I wanted from a job was um, a better work-life balance. I wanted to do something that I thought was impactful in the field that I care about, which is fake, like a vegan alternatives to food. And I, uh, I don't think that I needed to do a postdoc. I'm glad that I didn't. I am much happier now. And additionally, I feel that it's very easy to move up, at least in my, in my company so far. I'm already kind of thinking about like, okay, how long do I want to wait before I'm like, okay, I'd like to be a senior scientist now. Or like, how long do I wait before I ask my boss that I, if I can start to manage some um, new employees, people that we might be hiring soon. And it seems like the ball is kind of in my court. And that um, if I can be a good employee and do my best and ask for what I want, then I'll be able to get those things and not have to wait for, you know, X number of years before I ask those questions. Brandon, what do you think? Um, so that's very interesting. I actually knew by my second year of grad school that uh, doing a postdoc will be my own personal level of hell. And so I went into it knowing that industry is what I want to do. Um, also because like, echoing what Megan had said, like, I really want to focus more so on a work-life balance. Uh, because grad school, there is no, there aren't really boundaries that you can establish that are healthy um, between your work and your PI because you're a student, um, but you're not really a student. And so you have all the, you have all this access, you have keys to the building. So it's like work, work, work. And one of the things that I really focused on uh, when I was gearing up to leave grad school and was applying for jobs is um, I wanted to live in a place that I uh, would actually enjoy um, living in. So I was only looking for jobs in LA because um, I'm from LA, a lot of family from LA. And so uh, that was priority number one for me was I need to live in a place that I will enjoy living in because now that I'm in a job, there is no cutoff deadline for, oh, you're only going to be here for five years. Uh, now it's, well, you'll be here until you'll be here, essentially. And so that kind of um, directed how I went about my search and what type of jobs I wanted. And the second thing I really wanted was um, the ability to clock out. And I keep saying that because it makes such a difference when you leave academia where you'll get emails after you leave for the day and you will say, that's not my problem until tomorrow morning. And it's perfectly acceptable um, to do that um, now, especially now, um, even, even with a, a number of, of my coworkers working from homes, mainly management, um, where it's, it's okay to say, you know, I received your response, I'll reply in the morning because like I'm off now and I'm hourly. Um, actually, that relating back to your question, Herminder, that's kind of the, the biggest thing to be aware of is there is a difference between hourly and salary. It doesn't really seem like it, but um, when you are hourly like me, it's like, well, I am counting every single hour that I'm getting paid. And if I'm not getting paid, I don't want to work because I'm not being compensated for it. And that's a perfectly okay mindset to have in, uh, at least in my uh, job, hopefully in industry-wide, but um, 
where it is okay to firmly establish those boundaries where it's like, I'm not doing any more work for the day and that is okay. Um, but much like Megan had said, like, I wasn't really caught off guard by anything um, once I actually got my industry job. Um, and that's because um, all throughout grad school, I made it a point to, um, because I knew I wanted to go to industry, is to have as many mentors and as many contacts in industry just so I can have a, a wide range of experiences to relate to where it's like, okay, so you told me this, I know what to look forward to for that, um, and so on and so forth. So when I actually got here, it was actually really, it is all things considered, it's kind of a, a, a relatively easy transition um, to get accustomed to what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis versus uh, grad school. Um, and so it, it helped knowing what I wanted to look forward to um, going into a job that kind of, I found a job that fit that rather than trying to make myself fit into a job position um, that just came up because, you know, I needed a job and like, um, it, it sucked being unemployed for a couple months, but um, it also was a really nice break. But yeah, so it just knowing what I wanted really geared that and it also helped me cut down on um, job opportunities that I was like, you know, like this would be good, but realistically, do I actually want to live in this particular city? Do I actually want to do this work? And so on and so forth. And you can actually glean a lot of that do, uh, during a lot of the um, screening rounds and kind of phone interviews and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, get a, you get a glimpse of what you're actually comfortable with when you get to actual position, because the, the biggest thing that um, actually um, one of my mentors stressed was like, you can say no. Um, it, I mean, it will suck because you have to start the entire job process over again if you do mm -hmm. say no, but you can say no at any point in time. And also you're not, you're, you're obligated to work, but you don't have to necessarily work at this job if you're not happy, like you can leave. And there's not really a punishment for you because what are they gonna do but be mad? Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of going in with that mindset of like, you know, I do, they, they, need, they need someone, to, they need to hire someone so obviously if they're interested in me, like that's a good thing, but also like you still have power even if you don't think you have power when it comes to interviewing and saying yes or no to the ultimate job um, um, opportunity. So um, that was kind of the biggest thing, um, just kind of confirming all the things I heard, but I didn't really experience. And then now I'm here and it's like, okay, yeah, no, this is, this is fine. And I actually like it, so um, yeah. That's good. Thank you, Brandon. And, and the person, Jehan, who asked question, he really liked the, both the answers. <laughs> Thank you. So I now have a question, and these are, again, two different questions. And I know where these two questions are emanating from, um, because when I was a grad student, my PI, and I told him that I would like to get into industry, and the response was like, yeah, I think you should do a postdoc. The postdoc will help you to get into industry, right? And so, and that's one of the questions. So this is for Erin and Gilbert, since both of you have gone through postdoc, what do you think? Do you think postdocs was needed to, um, or required to get into industry positions? Um, so I don't think a, a postdoc would, would be absolutely necessary. You know, I've, we have people who came into similar positions who don't have postdocs. Um, you know, in terms of the particular skill set that I got while being a postdoc, that helped me get this position um, because the, the particular assay and technique that we use in this company, that's the one that I, I got during my, my postdoc. I had never done that um, during my grad school years. So, you know, in terms of broadening your skill set, a postdoc could be helpful. Um, the other thing, that I would say that would be helpful that doesn't necessarily have to be only gleaned through doing a postdoc is um, more multitasking and collaboration. So, you know, if you have an opportunity to do more of that as a graduate student, I think that will help. That's a skill set that that will serve you well when you come over into industry because you have just your specific projects that you're working on, but then, you know, you have to help out on other ones. Um, and so you have to be able to keep more plates in the air. I keep way more plates in the air now, right? I probably have probably about six or seven different like full blown color coordinated Excel sheets that I use to keep all um, the juggling happening. 
And so that's not necessarily like as, as a grad student, I didn't have that many things going on simultaneously. I had my projects, I was managing undergrads, I was being a TA because my boss was in, in the process of retiring, so he wasn't getting a whole lot of funding, so I had to end up TAing quite a bit um, as a graduate student as to save the money for my actual research, which I needed the money for my research. Um, and then as, as a postdoc, you do increase your level of, of responsibility. You have more ownership of your projects. I managed even more undergrads. I managed other master's students. I ended up running the co-running co um, the vivarium, which was a completely different skill set. Um, and so, you know, really the thing that, that came over most for me in my postdoc was just the level of multitasking on different projects, not only your own, um, but then also the particular assay. Um, so if you have a chance to collaborate with other labs um, on campus, I did that a little bit as a graduate student, but you know, I do that obviously a whole lot more now. Um, you know, trying to broaden your view and have more people that you're working with. Um, I know that's not gonna be the case for everybody's project. It really depends on how amenable your lab is, you know, how much um, data transfer and like knowledge you can, you can share. But if that's something that you can do and you can sort of work into your graduate school um, experience, I think that'll really serve you well without having to do a postdoc before you guys <laughs> come over to industry. Thank you. Gilbert, what do you think with your uh, So uh, certainly the postdoc just helps. Uh, so as bad as you think grad school is, postdoc's worse. Uh, it's more <laughs> that throat. You have less security with the grad student if they fail you out. It looks bad on the department. So they really try to, to help grad students, postdocs. They'll cut you loose at the drop of a hat in most cases. Uh, so you, you, you learn a little bit more politicking uh, as a postdoc. And when you work in a big company, there's some, there's still some egos. You still, you know, have to 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 deal with people, even though you, you your success is integrated. You still have to learn to interact with different types of people, and uh, you certainly have a little bit more experience uh, uh, as a postdoc. However, there, there's a lot of depending on the the, the grad school uh, experience and what like department. If you're in a chemical engineering department. Uh, and you do, you know, uh, chemical engineering, like large scale fermentation. If you have that experience, you don't need to do a postdoc. But if you don't have that experience, uh, it, you know, you look at a PhD and like, yeah, they don't really know, you know, the difference, you know, like formulation development for molecules, you know, it is really just a buffer screen. But, you know, how many times you've done that you know, kind of matters. So I think in my particular position, I might not have gotten the job as a senior scientist without the postdoc, but we do have uh, some people who just did PhDs or, or masters in, in our, uh, our program uh, or our departments, the, the two groups in our department. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, my particular position, you know, required a lot of knowledge and I don't know that I would have been able to get the expertise to make me a, a, an attractive candidate without, you know, 15 years of mm -hmm. doing basically every biophysical technique uh, mm -hmm. imaginable. I mean, you can get that as a grad student, but, you know, if you're running the lab that does biophysical characterization, you kind of need to know everything in there mm -hmm. and have some demonstrated competency mm -hmm. in them. Um, but not for every position, uh, certainly. Um, it just so, depends on the, the, the details of the position. So that's, that's, that's good to know because this, this question has come up many times and a lot of students do ask me that, should I do a postdoc or not? So it's pretty much, it's not necessary, but again, it depends on what kind of job, you know, within industry uh, you're looking for. And based on that, you have to prepare for it. Unless, you know, you have something very unique skill set, which the company wants, then I guess believe you don't have to do a postdoc. But if you want to do, uh, be at a more like a manager level position, managing a research group, maybe then postdoc is required. Who wants to know what kind 
kind of transferable skills or what kind of like skills you learn or were very useful to transition into your current job? What are some of those things which you learned are, are, are needed at the job? Um, Megan or Brandon, you can start and then we'll go to Erin and Gilbert. Yeah, sure. So it's come up a few times, but being able to communicate effectively across the company is really key, especially when you're working with people who have such a diverse array of experience. So being able to take your small specific chemical or biological problem and convey it to someone who might have less expertise or experience is super important. So I would say um, a lot of the things that I did with GPS STEM, then GPS Biomed, working on communication of science. So for example, elevator pitch, working on crafting um, good interview responses, those kinds of communication skills are, are super crucial. And I definitely think that my time at UC Irvine and doing a bunch of like speaking stuff helped me go to my in-person interview, give a good talk, and that really set the groundwork. That kind of made people understand that um, that I was a good candidate and that I knew some stuff. So that I think is really important. And then I learned a lot about interview or um, pardon me, resume prep, both through GPS STEM, but also by working with Lauren Lyons um, and that was crucial, tailoring every single resume for a specific position, getting a lot of feedback um, on my resume, making sure it was as clean and as polished and professional as it could be. Thank you, Brandon. So I think probably the biggest thing for me was to have a teachable spirit. And what I mean by that is um, when, go when you're going to the industry, um, we all know that you have the advanced degree and like that's great, but also you're stepping into a new environment where uh, it's no longer really beneficial for you to speak in such a technical jargony way because a lot of times one, either the people don't really follow or two, they don't really care. And just as, as, as an example, um, I was on a phone call with one of um, our customers last week and um, my supervisor was trying to tell me, it's like, they don't need to know all the details because honestly, they don't care. They just want to see their end product. And so it's recognizing that you have to take, you have to decenter yourself when it comes to communicating your science and understanding where your client or customer is coming from and what they want out of the situation. And so I think um, GPS Bomet really stressed that in that um, because you're interacting with a bunch of scientists, but they, they're scientists who can understand science, but they don't necessarily have your scientific background, that it comes from a, a position where you need to know how to communicate that effectively, but also know what's applicable or not. Otherwise, you're just wasting everyone's time. And um, that's, off, that's which leads me to my next point, that time, time management and time just, um, there's now that I am in, more involved in the more managerial side of my project, um, there's a lot of meetings and a lot of times I can't get all my work done. And so one of the things that um, GPS Biomed kind of reinforced and also um, was the fact that um, you don't have to do everything yourself. And like you're, you're supposed to work in a collaborative environment because you're not expected to do everything by yourself. Um, you're going to fail that way ultimately. And um, just kind of understanding that, yes, you're, you're capable and you're able, but you're still growing and learning and maintain that mindset and it, will give, it, it won't cause as much grief during the transition itself. And then um, also relating back to GPS Biomed, I actually got my job from LinkedIn. Um, it's, it's miraculous if you just input that you want recruiters to contact you, a lot of them will. Um, especially during like those periods when they are looking for jobs. I'm, I'm not going to comment on the current environment because the pandemic, but uh, for me, what kind of helps um, guide me through all the um, interviews, screenings, whatever, was maintaining my LinkedIn profile, tailoring it to the position I actually wanted. And I learned those techniques through the various GPS um, biomed events, some of which I even put on. Um, so I used to be an intern there. Um, but yeah, so it's just descending yourself, I guess, ultimately, and, and learning how to communicate, not just science, but just from a person point of view, um, in that your coworkers will like you a lot more if you're amicable, um, especially because you will be working with them more. And if you can't do something, usually there's someone else that can do it for you. Um, and if you're you know, nice to them, even if you don't particularly care all the time, 
um, they're willing to help you. And because it not only is it for the betterment of the company, but um, because it's like, oh, we have a cool relationship. Sure, I'll take like five minutes to explain something to you that's not really related to my project or something I did in the past. I um, mean, I can I can give you that knowledge so that you have it, and then the next person that comes along, like you can do the same thing. So it's all you're constantly reaching back, and you're constantly um, reestablishing um, connections, even in a workplace environment. So. Mm -hmm. So for Erin and Gilbert, I'm going to phrase the question slightly differently because you were postdoc or grad student a long time ago, and now you're in a position where you're looking for, you know, you are in the process of recruitment, you look for candidates. What, is, what are a couple of like important traits, skills you look for when you're hiring new employees who have PhD or postdoc background? We can start with Erin. Um, it's interesting. When I was doing my interview process coming here and now being on the other side of the table, right? Actually being the person to now try and, and hire people for different kinds of positions. Um, depending on the type of position that you're hiring for, um, there can be very specific skill sets that you need to have, right? If it's a wet lab position, do you have wet lab experience? Do you know, a particular assay, how do you run it, what is your success rate, that sort of thing, right? Um, but there's also, you know, what, what Brandon said of the fact that it's a team that you're going to be working on, and in the case of multi-amics, it's about 20 people, but then you're interfacing with a lot more people, so it depends on the sort of size of your company and as it grows. Um, I know it sounds really simple, but it's not always just the hard transferable skills, like how well do I pipette? Um, it's hopefully you're already not a jerk, but if you can communicate <laughs> that you're a nice person and that you're, you would be um, a good team member to have. And, you know, ha you know, probably about a third to a half of the questions that I had um, during my interview here at NEO was about sort of interpersonal skills and soft skills. So communication, conflict management, mentoring, things like that. Um, because when you have, you, you can learn new things, right? As PhDs, we are professional learners. Um, if you don't know something, you can pick it up. You can go search PubMed, you can, you know, if you like doing wet lab and you want to continue doing wet lab, you can get other new wet lab skills. Um, but if somebody doesn't like to learn, if they're not a team player, if just, if the fit's not right, it doesn't matter what they know. It will still be grading within your team. And you will know that there's something not quite right. You know, you're not all pulling the wagon in the same direction. And that can be very problematic. Um, if everybody sort of gets along, you don't have to be best, bu best buds or anything like that. But just knowing that, hey, if you need a little bit of extra work, I'll help you out. If I need a little bit of extra work, you'll help me out. Um, you know, that goes a long way. And so, you know, knowing, knowing your history and your resume, like backwards and forwards and all of your hard transferable skills, but, but your soft skills, like those, those should not ever be neglected either, you know, mm -hmm. communication um, and how you interact with people, what you want from people, um, what you want from your team, what do you bring, right? It's not just your pipetting hand that you're bringing, right? You are a person. And mm -hmm. how do you think you would also feel? So kind of like what Brandon said is that there is power in both ways, right? You're trying to get a job, money, security, but then mm -hmm. you don't want to fit, you don't want to go into a company where you're a bad fit either, because we've all done that in grad school. Um, and so we know the pain of being in a job where you don't really care for your boss or you don't feel like you are a priority or that you're special at all. You know, you're a dime a dozen. Um, mm -hmm. and depending on what size of company you're in, you know, you are valuable and one person can make a huge difference. So, so make sure that you can, you can sort of communicate the other sort of soft, um, skills that you have as well towards not being a jerk face when you're actually in your work environment. That's, that's great to know. Um, Gilbert, would you like to, um, add yeah, anything? I would say exactly that, you know, you, most of my interview questions were about personality and like, oh, if, if uh, 
you know, the director says you need this, like, and you know they're wrong, you know they're wrong. Everybody knows they're wrong. How do you communicate with them? Stuff like that. Uh, so so being able to, to work with other people, like, you know, these are, it, it gets very tense because you're making million dollar decisions and, you know, nobody wants to be wrong. So, you know, how, how, how do you communicate with that? Uh, so, so that's, that's critical being able to deal with different types of people. Uh, and, you know, like obviously hard work because, you know, most of the stuff, a lot of the instruments we have are automated. So I can teach anybody how to do that in, you know, a half a day. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's more about, you know, thinking out of the box, right? Because a lot of stuff is, is automated, but, you know, how do you interpret things that are, you know, questionable, like you don't have a direct answer, like you should go one way or the other way. So being able to, to problem solve, I think is, is, is key in trying to, to tease, tease that out. Uh, but, you know, the majority of the candidates are, are pretty good at, at that. So then it often comes down to like, how, how are they going to work with other people? Do they give anybody bad vibes? Because, you know, you get that, you know, if you, if you have the experience where some postdoc comes and, you know, like everybody gets bad vibes from them and the PI still gives them the position, <laughs> it can really decimate the morale of everybody else in the group. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really just trying to keep everybody happy. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's, that's what, what I would say is, is key because you can teach mm -hmm. a lot of people things, uh, they can learn on their own, but you really can't teach niceness mm -hmm. or you know, decency. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is communication skills, teamwork, more mentoring or supervisory stuff, which you already do in the lab. And then more like out of the box thinking, sometimes even like sort of having an understanding of business concepts, you know, to understanding how the business enterprise runs, whether it's academia or industry, and, and a lot about being nice. With that, I would like to thank all the panelists for your time coming for the webinar and, and this panel discussion. Thank you.